Our fourth reading is from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 15. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, <clears throat> This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and said, what's going on? And he replied, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you. I never disobeyed your command. Yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. And may God speak to us through these verses today. Now, I'm sure most of us are familiar with this story. It's one of the best known and most beloved of Jesus' parables. And it's traditionally interpreted as a story about the grace and unlimited, unconditional love of God. It's also... Aside from that, which is good enough in itself, it also provides us, for Father's Day, a symbol of how God, how Jesus, wants us to see fathers. You know, this parable is traditionally called the parable of the prodigal son. And that's usually what we call this young man who takes his family inheritance and wastes it all on extravagant living. I mean, the word prodigal means wasteful, extravagant, and he is. Because now he's got nothing left to inherit. He blew through it all. He's penniless. He's alone. But we're told that one day he comes to himself, says, why am I letting myself suffer like this? I know, I'll go back to dad, beg forgiveness. And so off he heads home. And his father is so happy to see him that he celebrates his son's return with a big party. Now, I've mentioned before that there is some debate about whether this son really had a change of heart and repents, or is he just giving the old man a sob story and hoping that he buys it? But whatever the, the son's reason, we're told that his father spots him far away on the road and that he runs out to meet him. And before the son can give this rehearsed apology, the old man starts hugging and kissing him. He orders a new clothes and jewelry for the son. And to top it off, he decides to throw this 
big party, and it must be a big party because in those days a fatted calf was big enough to feed a village back then. Father's so happy that he wants the whole community to celebrate with him. My son was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. Now, Jesus told this story to some Pharisees who were grumbling because he hung out with people that they considered unclean sinners. The prodigal son would have been one of these unclean sinners, about as low as you could get. You know, he starts out demanding his inheritance, but, you know, since you can only inherit after a father is dead, he's basically telling dad, gee, dad, I wish you were dead. Can I have the money now? According to religious law, a father could have his son killed for such an insult. And the son also runs off. He turns his back on his own people. Now, the Pharisees would also have been very upset about the father in Jesus' story. Fathers were expected to be dignified, have authority over their families. This father would have looked weak and foolish to them. How could he put up with that disrespect? How could he give in to his son that way? And when the son comes crawling back, Father should have turned him away or punished him some way. Instead, he runs out to him and showers him with love and gifts. Talk about letting someone walk all over you. This was no respectable father. Now, again, the Pharisees criticized Jesus for hanging out with people like the prodigal son, and they would have been very offended when Jesus suggests to them that this weak, foolish father was a symbol of God. Jesus was saying that he welcomes such people because God welcomes them. God, says Jesus, runs down the road for them. He embraces and kisses them. He throws a party for them. God does not hate those people. God loves them. Loves them so much, God is even willing to look weak and foolish and get walked on. All in the hope that every prodigal child will come back to stay. Will come back and receive the life that God wants to give them. In other words, that they will repent. And one writer says, Jesus' message is pretty basic. If a parent can love that much, why can't you imagine God being like that? Now, As I said, this is typically called the parable of the prodigal son, but it's not really about the son. It's about the father. It's about God. Jesus was trying to get people to change many of their ideas and beliefs about God because he knew that the way we see God greatly determines how we see each other. And for Jesus, the old image of God was not only wrong, it was harmful. It harmed the way people thought about themselves and the way they treated each other. This old image of a God of condemnation and punishment, a God who withholds love and grace from the wrong kind of people, a God to be feared. That's how most people expected the father in the parable to act toward his wayward, sinful son. But in Jesus' story, there is none of that. There is only grace. Grace that manifests itself as mercy, forgiveness, and love. Grace that reconciles and restores. The son is welcomed home and treated as if he never left, as if he never sinned. Maybe even better than before. But the only question now is whether he will stay and accept this new life, to accept this unconditional love that the Father has for him, and whether he will let that life, this love, transform him. Now, as I said, we should call this probably the parable of the prodigal father or prodigal God because that's who the real hero of the story is. And as I said, the word prodigal means wasteful and extravagant. And frankly, the God that Jesus reveals to us is indeed extravagant, overflowing with grace, filled with love, both of them greater than our sin. And yes, it might seem 
that God's love is wasted on some folks because they don't respond to it. If we're honest, there are probably times when it might seem wasted on us too. But it doesn't matter. It does not stop God from loving and forgiving, no matter how much we squander or how far we wander. Because that's just who God is. And it's who God is trying to help all of us become too. Now as for the older brother in the story, we can't believe this father is being so gracious and forgiving to this shameful younger brother. The older brother never left. He remained loyal and respectful, a hard worker who kept the place running. And when he hears that the father is throwing a party for this younger brother, he gets angry and he refuses to join in. So the father comes out and he pleads with him, but the older brother won't have any part of it. I've slaved for you all these years. I've obeyed all your rules. I stayed on the straight and narrow. Never threw a party for me. But this son of yours comes back. And you notice he won't even call him brother. He won't even acknowledge that they're family. This son of yours who wasted everything on sinful living comes back. And you fawn all over him. His point is that this is not fair. It's not right. Where are the consequences? Why bother being good and faithful if there's no reward for it? Or if there's no punishment if you're not faithful? Now, of course, the younger brother did face consequences. He ruined his life doing the wrong things, pursuing pleasures that never last long. And he wound up miserable, separated from his father's love. So he did receive punishment. It just wasn't the father who punished him. Now, logically, this means that the reward for faithfulness and devotion should be joy and fulfillment. The fulfillment of living a good life in pursuit of the right things and the joy of remaining close to the father's love. Those are rewards. But the older brother doesn't see it that way. He doesn't think such rewards are enough, apparently. He certainly does not sound joyful or fulfilled. How does he describe his life of faith? Slavery, a burden, something he felt he owed to the Father instead of something he freely gave his Father out of love. He felt he owed it either because he was afraid of punishment or because he expected some special reward, something beyond the reward of a good life in his father's love. And now he's resentful. He resents that his younger brother gets to return to a celebration instead of punishment. He resents his own life of devotion and hard work because he finds out, guess what? The father loves the son who sinned and strayed as much as the son who never strayed. The father loves the unfaithful child as well as the faithful child. In fact, what the older brother finds out is that the father does not love either one of them for what they do. The father loves them both for who they are. They're both his beloved children. And it is the father's nature to love. That's who the father is. That's who he wants his children to be. Now, it might seem odd, it does to me, that the older brother didn't know this. None of that rubbed off on him. The younger brother ran off, spent a lot of time away. Maybe that's a, an excuse for not knowing his father better. But the older brother should have been wiser. He was there with the father all the time. Yet he didn't really know his father. And he had not become more like him. Instead, he grew bitter and judgmental, unforgiving, and self-righteous. And so now is when we might think the father will finally show anger. He'll finally run out of patience and grace. And he will disown this older brother for his hard-heartedness. No. My son, he says, you are always with me. You haven't lost anything. You still have your share of my inheritance. All I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and rejoice because your brother 
And he makes a point of reminding him they're still family. Your brother was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. In other words, my love for him does not take away from my love for you. It's not a contest. I love you both the same. And you should be as happy as I am that he is here. And that's where the story ends. How do things stand? The younger brother is inside at the party. And the only question is whether he'll stay. The older brother is outside looking in. The only question is whether he will join the party. And we should notice one very important thing in this. Nobody has been disowned or disinherited. Nobody has been condemned. The Father shows the same grace to everyone. If there is any condemnation or punishment, it's what the two sons do to themselves and to each other. The lives that they create for themselves. But it's not anything the Father does to them. The Father loves and forgives them both. Now, maybe the older brother believed that he was a fool to stay on the straight and narrow, a fool to work so hard for his father all those years, thinking he was earning his father's love, thinking he deserved more love than his awful brother, only to find out the father doesn't love him any more or less than the brother, but loves them both the same, only to find out that the father does not love either of them for anything they do or don't do, but for who they are, his children. The father is not really interested in rewards or punishment. He is only interested in giving the one inheritance, the one party, the one great and unchanging love to everyone. And that, according to Jesus, is who God is. A God whose love is much greater than any sense of what we might believe is fair or right. Now this parable suggests that Jesus does not want any of us to be motivated by fear or selfish interest, not by the promise of rewards or the threat of punishment, because that kind of motivation can be harmful to us. It can turn us into the older brother, judgmental, unforgiving, self-righteous, and resentful of the grace that God shows to people that we don't think measure up to our standards. It can turn our faith into into nothing more than a kind of strict rule-keeping or even a kind of slavery, this joyless burden that we force on ourselves and try to force on others. Jesus wants us to be motivated by love, the kind of love we see in the Father. He does not hold grudges. He does not play favorites. He forgives and restores. For Jesus, it is God's infinite and eternal love for us that should inspire us to love God and then choose to follow God's will, to freely give our lives to God, not for reward, not for fear of punishment, but out of gratitude and love. God's love should inspire us to love and accept ourselves, even in spite of our weaknesses and our sins, and to love and accept others in spite of theirs too. This is who God is, says Jesus. And it does provide us as a model for fatherhood as well. As I said, in those days, fathers were expected to be very dignified and very stern and strict with their families, be in control. And frankly, for centuries, that has often been a role model for fathers. Don't show emotion. Be stern, be firm, don't give in. 
But we need to let love soften these things. We need to let love be the motivating, guiding factor. We need to encourage children and fathers in their relationship, parents and children, to see themselves as part of something together and to reflect this relationship between God and us in the family life. That's what God hopes for us. That's what God is trying to help us to do. Amen.